Our first uh, speaker this morning is Sarah, uh, Sarah George, and uh, she is a um, she's the executive director of the Natural History Museum of Utah and the adjunct professor of um, and the adjunct professor of biology at the University of Utah. Uh, working in museums since she was an undergraduate at the uh, University of the Puget Sound, she received her doctorate at the University of New Mexico as a field biologist, mammalogist, and uh, evolutionary geneticist. After completing graduate school in 1984, she was the curator of mammals at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and uh, holding um, adjunct uh, faculty appointments in the biology departments at uh, USC and UCLA. And I'm gonna pass this to her so she can, uh, she can tell us uh, and give her talk this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's really a pleasure to be here today, and I also want to acknowledge Randy's work over the years to help the libraries and museums here on campus, and I know across the country and around the world, to think about disasters and to plan for them and to prepare us all for them, uh, because they're going to happen. I mean, look at what happened this year, um, tragically, in Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, Mexico. Um, so what uh, Randy asked me to do was to talk about uh, designing a museum in an active seismic zone. And um, what I'm going to do is uh, two things. First is to talk about how we designed the building to withstand a 7.0 earthquake. But then I thought I'd also talk about how the architects used seismicity to make a beautiful building. We think it's beautiful, and I hope you will too. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, I want to talk briefly about where we live and why this is an active seismic zone. So we're in the Basin and Range province, which is here and it stretches all of Nevada, sits in that province, and what's happened is there's magma under the surface of the earth that's rising and it's causing the crust to stretch. And so um, as it stretches, it fractures along all of these lines. And so the mountain ranges um, have uplifted as blocks and the um, uh, valleys in between, the range or the basins, have dropped. Um, and so the faults that you get are pieces of the earth stretching apart from each other, and those are called extension or normal faults. Um, this is different from um, Southern California and Baja, Mexico, where you have transverse faults, and that's where two plates are running, um, uh, one's moving in one direction, the other's moving in another. And both of these areas actually um, can generate earthquakes of magnitude seven um, here and here. And then of course we have a third kind of faulting in the western US where you have a plate going under the North American plate, the San Juan plate, and um, those are subduction faults and those are the big ones. Those are magnitude eight to nine. So the safest place to be is northern Idaho. <laughs> so. We have to live with it, um, <clears throat> and um, in the basin and range, the most active area is along the Wasatch Fault, which is the eastern edge. So this is a map of Salt Lake Valley. You can see a little bit of the Great Salt Lake. These are the Ochre Mountains to the west. This is the Wasatch Range, the Wasatch Mountains right behind campus, and this is called the Wasatch Fault Zone. It's kind of red. <laughs> And this, uh, this is a map of how much um, acceleration the Earth is going to create during an earthquake. And so here's downtown Salt Lake City. Um, here's the University of Utah. And um, for many years, 42 years actually, the museum was in a Depression era building that had Depression era engineering. Um, they cut a lot of financial corners. It was not a very safe building. Um, and in fact, the bookshelves in part of the building were structural. They held up the building. Think about that. So um, in fact, we, a number of years ago, decided to move. And we um, had formerly been right at the edge of this orange and yellow. And we've now moved up to the edge of the blue and the green. A little better. Not great, but a little better. Um, now, the site that uh, we picked 
uh, is actually a, um, a slope. And we really wanted to have an energy efficient building. So what do you do on a slope? Um, you excavate into the hillside because that creates um, thermal insulation for your building and, and helps you with your efficiency. The problem, of course, is that when you are building on a slope, you have a little problem with landslides. And so we had to think about how we were gonna terrace the building um, to keep a landslide from um, taking the building down the hillside. So um, what we did, uh, well, typically the, the response is to build the back of the building into a, a, t a retaining wall. But given the height of the building, the base of the, ter the retaining wall would have to be 25 to 30 feet, which is not very um, practical. So what they did is they came up with this structure. This is called a um, soldier pile. And these are 12 by four inch wooden um, beams that are tied into the hillside by these, there are cables attached here, and they hold, they're drilled 40 feet back into the hillside. At the upper part of the soldier pile, there was actually excavation, they tied it back, they put dirt down, they tied the next layer back, put more dirt down. So the weight of the hillside is actually holding it back. So in an earthquake, it may shake, but those cables are gonna keep the hillside from collapsing onto the building. Um, the next thing they did was covered that with concrete. Um, I love all the terms they use in construction. This is called shotcrete because they shoot it at <laughs> the soldier pile. So it's covered with this concrete. And then the building is um, built three feet away from the, the soldier pile. And today it looks like this. There's actually a three foot gap between the back of the canyon and the soldier pile um, that you can actually get down into. That photo was taken on Monday. <laughs> so this is how we've kept the hillside from coming down into the building. Um, now, one of the big problems with buildings is that you get this massive ground shaking, and if you don't have a proper foundation, it can start to collapse. This was, of course, um, from the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, and there are lots of problems with wooden foundations. They tend not to be very strong. Um, concrete that doesn't have enough steel reinforcement. Uh, and this is a real problem in the Mexican earthquake where they had buildings pancake. The floors just collapsed on each other. Um, locally, we, there's a, there are a lot of older buildings that have foundations made of sandstone of Red Butte right behind the museum. It's very soft and it's going to do the same thing in an earthquake. So um, we have some historical issues here. So how do you solve that? How do you um, absorb the energy of an earthquake without causing the building to collapse? Um, one thing is base isolators. And these are giant Teflon pads that the building sits on. And as the earth moves back and forth, this absorbs the energy and the building moves less. It may move for a long time. My mother was in the 2001 Nisqually earthquake on the 20th floor of the federal building in Seattle. And um, she said that building rocked for 20 minutes. But there was no damage. They really came through it really nicely. Um, so another potential, well, and we decided this is used often for very tall buildings, but less um, helpful in long buildings. And you do have to have a good strong substrate underneath. Um, so it, the architects decided that this was not the solution for us. Another solution is to use steel braces and you put them um, across. This is actually used a lot in reinforcing buildings. If you look right out this window, you can see some of those cross braces and that building was retrofitted at the time that this part of the Marriott Library was constructed. But it kind of wrecks your views. And um, at the museum, we wanted to take advantage of the view sheds um, because they're so extraordinary and use that as part of our exhibits. 
And so we decided that this was not a good solution for us. Um, what the architects decided on is what's called a shear wall. And a shear wall is concrete that is highly reinforced by steel, more than a typical concrete wall. And um, in an earthquake, uh, it absorbs the energy for the rest of the building. Uh, and um, and it, it helps absorb the lateral forces that you get um, in an earthquake. And then the floors are tied to those shear walls so that they don't collapse. Uh, and, and again, that's partly because of the enormous amount of steel in these. So this is a, con a photograph of the building as it's starting to go up. And you can see a whole series of shear walls, some of them facing um, various different directions. And that's because we don't know where the force is going to come from. It may come from the south, the southwest, to the west, the north. And so there are a whole um, series of them throughout the structure. Um, and another point is uh, these, you also build shear walls um, next to exits. So this is a big stairwell. This is a stairwell that, the first stairwell that was constructed, and one side of it um, is a shear wall. Um, building codes are not designed to minimize damage to the building. Well, they are to, to minimize damage, but not to totally prevent damage. The point of building codes is to allow people to survive and get out of the structure. And so that's, again, you know, why, one of the, sh why the shear walls are adjacent to stairwells in a building, so we can all get out. Um, if you, this is a cross section um, looking down on the third floor. There's a shear wall here, there's a shear wall here. They're scattered throughout the building at various different angles. And, um, and again, the floors are tied to them so we won't have a problem with pancaking during an earthquake. Um, and then the last point I'll make about um, earthquake uh, safety or prevention in the design is that this is really designed as three buildings. You have one building here, you have a second building here, and then a third building is only on level five, um, and that is a round gallery at the back um, that we call Native Voices. And um, they're, they're independent of each other, and so they will move independently during an earthquake. And as you get to the upper floors, the party will be on level five, Look for big steel plates in the floor, and that's where the building is going to um, move. And they've actually um, measured the amount of um, movement in the summertime between nighttime and, and day on very hot days, and the building actually flexes four to six inches within a 24-hour period um, from temperature changes. So. Um, that, that helps us um, uh, minimize damage from that as well. So, <clears throat> now, let's talk about art. You all are art conservators. Um, and um, one of the things that the architects did was they thought about the um, place we live in, Utah, which is extraordinarily beautiful, and they used it um, in two ways. They used it to think about the form of the building, and they used it to think about the facade of the building. So we'll talk first about form, um, and actually I'll even step back further. When we hired these architects, we threw them in the back of a bunch of SUVs and we drove them all over Utah. Um, <laughs> fortunately, our vehicles were better than that. And um, they saw things like they saw how there are layers of rock that are different colors and different textures and different ages um, standing out from each other. They saw the layers of rock and they also saw faulting. It's kind of hard, to, this is such a gorgeous photo, I had to put it in, but there are two faults. There's a fault here and there's some dropping of this block and a fault here and there's a little more dropping so that the layers aren't perfectly straight. Um, and they took note of that. They also noted how the substrates are tilted. And as you look at Salt Lake, the Salt Lake Valley, um, the east side is tilting down and the Wasatch Mountains are tilting up. And when you look at Mount Olympus, which is 
in the middle part of the valley, the sediments are almost vertical, and that is from this seismic um, uh, effect. So they thought about that, and they um, started to think about the building as tectonic plates. And so you have three plates that are sheared. Now I will say, this is a transverse fault. It's not actually an extension fault, but hey, it's artistic license. Um, <laughs> and, and so we have three blocks here. Then they cracked it down the middle, shifted it back, and opened it here so that the center of the building is actually a canyon um, that is our atrium or our grand lobby space. And the building follows the contours of the slope. And this is another view of it. This is the south end, the exhibitions, the canyon in the middle here, and then the north end are the collections, the research labs. That's the back of house stuff that you'll see between 3.30 and 5 this afternoon. So that's how they thought about the form. The next thing is the facade. And um, they, they, I think, did a, an amazing job of thinking about different textures and materials. So we have copper, we have concrete, and then this, it's hard to tell in this photo, but this is an, ena an enameled aluminum. And each one of those reflects different textures, different colors, and also um, sedimentary layers that have shifted. Um, so they were thinking of a big facade like this with all these different materials making it up. And um, as you look at it, you'll see that there are faults in the copper. A close up here, you can see the faults in the copper and the sedimentary layers um, are offset. And so think about it as a great geology lesson um, for what's happening in the Great Basin. So this is a block fault. Um, the concrete also is layered. This is, it's hard to tell in this photo, but this is that enameled, um, and the sedimentary layers are vertical in that. And you can stand right about here and look down the Wasatch Front and see the vertical enamel, and in the background, Mount Olympus, which is almost at vertical. Um, so it, I think they did an amazing job as you walk up to the museum, take a look back, and enjoy the geology that um, you'll see. So um, I want to thank you for the invitation. I also want to acknowledge some folks in the audience. Um, Janaki Krishna and Megan Mizuda are in our registrar's office, and now Janaki oversaw the move of 1.6 million objects from our old building to our new. Um, Ann Hannibal is our associate director, and she was curator of collections for um, a while earlier and um, oversaw the, act, the move of collections from the departments on campus to the museum. Um, so, and then um, Glenna, you've already been introduced in anthropology, she'll be there. And um, Bill Thomas is going to speak about how we're protecting the objects that are actually on display. So thank you very much. I'm under time. You're under time. Questions? Are there questions? Wow. Nice. Come on, you guys. This is the director <laughs> of the museum. It's the museum. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I just have one question. It seems like so much of um, seismic design for buildings has to do with lateral movement as opposed to up and down. So how is this building supported underneath? Does it have those Teflon bumpers? No, we, did, we chose not to do the Teflon pads. And so um, most of the damage actually takes place from lateral motion, um, whatever direction. And that's when um, buildings get thrown off their foundations. Um, I took a tour of Whittier, California a few days after the Whittier earthquake. And um, all the buildings had just been tossed off their foundations. If they were wood structures, they stayed whole. If they were concrete, they crumbled and collapsed. And, um, and so uh, um, they, they don't worry too much about up and down motion. It's the lateral motion that creates the damage. 
The rare occasion is what happened in the Marina District in San Francisco where the soil liquefied, and we do have a problem with liquefaction um, west of downtown where the sediments are, are not um, consolidated. And in that case, heavy buildings will sink into the ground. But that's a pretty rare occurrence, and you prevent that by um, putting very deep piers um, below the building as far down, hopefully, into bedrock. Yes? Shear walls look like they're really, really um, thin. Um, compared to the other walls, they're really, really thick. Yeah, oh. and, and you also have to think about scale. So the shear walls are probably 18 to 24 inches deep, which is a pretty deep, solid piece of concrete. Um, but those were three stories high, so it, it, they look thinner than they are. Right. <laughs> Talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh. Hi. Um, was there also earthquake mitigation um, issues um, uh, dealing with the stanchions, with the vitrines, with individual things in the galleries as well, or is it, did you, are you really focused on building, um, receiving all of the? Yeah, um, and, and Bill Thomas can really address that a lot more. Um, most of the cases are um, pretty solid and attached to the floor. And um, we, we built them so that they have doors. There are very few cases where you actually have to lift off like a, a classic vitrine. Um, but I'm going to let Bill answer that question. <laughs> yeah, because it's a perfect segue. Yeah, it is, exactly. I have one quick question. Yeah. What happened to your old building? Oh, <laughs> so the old building yeah. um, basically was gutted. The part that um, had the bookshelves that held the building up, that's completely gone. And um, Ann Hannibal and I, who lived in that, we lived in that building for years and years and toured it um, while it was gutted before they had rebuilt it. And it was just amazing how, um, you know, all the work that they were doing to stabilize it. And um, we had a hard time finding our offices. <laughs> Uh, um, but it's um, being built out um, from the front out to the back, and it will be um, a College of Science building, the Center for Genomic Studies, the Center for Science and Math Ed, and then a number of classrooms. So you can see it, but you can't get into it quite yet. I think they're opening in the spring. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.